Valentino giving me suits, gangsters. Discretion TV, salute that. Number one Tupac channel host, Valentino. About his money. Right. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying I'm the richest nigga in the game because Fresh Prince. All these, it's a lot of niggas with money. But I'm saying it's like, it's not the money that I'm bragging about. When people see me with the Jews, it's not that. It's Manifestation. For these, yes, it's for these little niggas to see. You just see me in cuffs, shot up in a wheelchair with my head wrapped up. And you see me less than a fucking year later bailing through this motherfucking Jew down like Sakazulu. Banging on niggas. I got this whole shit shook up. You hey, wanna you know, make your money, I'm, I'm, you gotta rap for the bitches. Do not rap for the niggas. Yeah, I told yeah, a nigga, yeah. don't rap for the niggas. The rap for the part. bitches. The bitches will buy your records and the niggas want what the bitches want. So all of a sudden he changed from being listen to party and bullshit. Listen to his style. He changed from that to Big Pop. Supposed to catch that because the first joint was ready to die. The way I was feeling when I did ready to die was I was feeling like I was already dead. It's a new beginning, you know what I'm saying? It's the life after the death. Yo. Because of me, he had my album, Me Against the World, was the second one. He had the first one. I changed everything, because Ready to Die came out, and it sounded like my album. Mm -hmm. All my album was about, you know, dealing with death. Mm -hmm. And then he came out Ready to Die, and I had to switch it. Wow. That's why it was less East Coast rap, East Coast beats, because Biggie had just took my shit. That's what, but you can listen to it. That's what, that, that was his success, too, because he took, like, Listen, West Coast sound. We flipped and it. I slang. told him that. I told you know, him that I trained. He was supposed to be. He was supposed to be Thug Life. Mm -hmm. All while he was coming up, I used to let him come on stage with me. He was screaming Thug Life. Hey, cause I he was like, I hate Stadium. Brooklyn. I hate me. I don't, I'm out with them niggas. Puffy cheating me. Woo woo woo. All of a sudden, he blew up, and he wasn't saying Thug Life. Mm -hmm. So I started getting mad, and I was seeing the niggas place. He was hugging me, yo, Pac. Yo, thank you. He's the only nigga that woo woo. woo. But he and he told me like about a week before I got shot. He knew the nigga that was shot me, and he was like, Pop, don't hang around this nigga, you know what I mean? You know, we walked in with the nigga that shot me, and ended up shooting me. He's like, Pop, don't fuck with this nigga, because I knew the nigga too, he was my Kogi fan. And uh, I was like, what you mean? He's like, I'll talk to you about it later, and we didn't talk. Ne the next time I saw him was at the studio where I got shot. So I knew he knew what happened. Mm -hmm. So I was like, Biggie, what happened? He kept sending me messages like a bitch, you know, like, I'ma mm -hmm. come see. No, nigga, what happened? While I'm in jail, strangers is telling me, yo, you don't know? Biggie Homeboy shot you. Cause they bragging, they telling they niggas in jail. Yo, we just got popped, woo, 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 woo. And my cousin was in jail in New York cause I got family out there. Mm -hmm. He sit right there while the niggas get in the car going, yo, my homeboy's just jacked that nigga Tupac. So that's how I knew, shot me what happened and everything. They mad because I know what happened. That's why they all, you know that's it's Biggie and them, they're not yeah. rotten. Mm -hmm. That's why what I'm doing, I know what I'm doing. I'm destroying them. Mm -hmm. I fucked his wife, I'm fucking them in the game, I'm destroying them. He lives by the rules of the game. He lives off a mafia image. I'm bringing him, showing how he, he totally disregarded the rules of the game, and he's everything but a mafia nigga. Mm -hmm. He's reinventing it. Right, I'm showing him. Nah, you know what I mean? Like, if anybody's a mafia he, nigga, me, nigga. He, I fucked your bitch. Parts of your life, uh, relationship with faith. Mm -hmm. um, how would that? I mean, we ain't together no more. She just had a baby for me. Or whatever, you know. We ain't together. Right. We cool, though. We tight. That's cool. You know, that's all everybody really wanted to hear. Yeah, we that's cool. It ain't like we warring at each other now. We be at the studio or whatever. She working on her new album, The Bomb. Right. You know what I'm saying? We just be you kicking got, it. You got new it's stuff. just the relationship ain't work out. But, you know, we gonna always be together because, you know, we got a little story together. So, that's the, gonna be the happy part. Hey, nigga, I fucked your you know? bitch. I took five shots. I went in your crew. I mean, I just... But what's gonna reign supreme in 96 and 97 is the ride I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And it's not even like, I feel like I'm doing it for hip hop. Mm -hmm. All I'm trying to do is get the imposters out. I remember Biggie sleeping on my couch. I remember begging bitches to fuck him. <laughs> oh! You feel yeah, me? Yeah. So, Big Papa don't mean nothing to me. He know it. He yeah. know it. That's why he can't fight me. That's why he can't battle me. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can make know, songs you know talking exactly telling. about yeah. him. And he can't talk about me because he know. He know I'm the know one that used to buy him champagne. All that shit he talking, that was me buying him that. He talking about my lifestyle, his album. Because when he was doing his album, he was broke, nigga. I was having money. I, the, the shit he talked about was my life. Thug life. That's what he talking about. All that junior mafia, them niggas was young motherfuckers that used to hang around that I used to give money to to get on a train to go home at night. Little season and all of them. And Kim and all that. Yeah, so now they rapping against me. and You, you can imagine how I fucking feel. Mm -hmm. 
When, when I got arrested in New York, I got arrested for Biggie. Them guns in my room was Biggie's guns because them cowards left the room when they heard the police was downstairs and everybody left their guns in my room. So I got four guns in my room. Serial numbers scratched out and I did not snitch. I took that case. So you can imagine how I feel when I'm in jail for that case. And he out there living a mafia lifestyle, giving me no money, giving me no respect, giving me no tribute. Rolling with my road dog who was there when I got shot. I mean, come on, man. I'm not paranoid. Mm -hmm. I'm not paranoid. Nah, nah, Y'all niggas know what time it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what it is is that the East Coast drug dealers got them niggas under extortion. I came and fucked up everything. So what they did was jumpstart me to be a better man. Why they let me go, I don't know, but I'm out. Why they let me go, I don't know, but I'm out. I basically did because, you know, Pac was uh, my little brother ain't the number one artist out on the bond. And if he would have got in trouble, he was going back to prison. Yeah. So I knew if cameras anywhere in Vegas because I went to UNLV and she took it to the top of him and that's why. If you really did, you know. I mean, when I left that hospital, me and Pac was laughing and choking. So I don't see how somebody can turn from doing well to doing bad. You know, a lot of people say, well, God's gonna judge me. I got like a 40, I got a 45 inch bullet in my head into my skull by grabbing Tupac, pulling him down. That's really what happened. The second part of it is this. People know what happened at the end of the day. You got, you got, you got an individual on there and said, okay, we did this shooting. You know, Puffy was there, Biggie was there. He was already paid for to kill Tupac. This was, this how it happened. And they break everything down to the T. And I'm saying to myself, people say, well, damn, if this dude told a feds and everybody that he's a rip or a former rip out of Compton and they killed Tupac, why didn't he go to jail for murder? Then maybe the question is that Pac really not dead. Pac somewhere else and, oh, and maybe they get over. Maybe it's, I mean, Ooh, it's the truth one. if you really look so at you, it. Did you see Tupac dead? Nobody's seen Tupac dead. The, the thing is this. Um, the person who supposedly cremated Tupac, who I, you know, his mother wanted done uh, quickly if he was, if he passed. So, this guy got about three million dollars, personally for me, cash, and next thing I know, I never heard from the guy I seen again. He retired and left. But still, there are other questions that may give cadence to the rumors surrounding Tupac's death. Tupac Shakur, according to his entourage, always wore a bulletproof vest. But why didn't he wear one the night he was shot? Some even question whether Tupac was really cremated the day after he died, reportedly before an autopsy could be conducted. Why were plans for a big public funeral all of a sudden scratched? And why weren't pictures of Tupac supposedly taken in the hospital never released? Do you know Russell Poole wanted to apologize to you? Yeah, I heard that. I mean, he's a good guy. I never lied to him or nobody because, you know, all that stuff. They know who was going on behind all that stuff, you know? Yeah. Well, he couldn't, in his mind, uh, separate you from Death Row Records. And oh, as, okay. you, as we were doing the investigation, I said, you have to understand, Russell, that, you know, Mr. Knight was, uh, you know, in the car next to Tupac. I mean, that's not. And then with the Biggie thing, Mr. Knight was in jail. And I, 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 mean, met, I met somebody who was in jail with you at the time, and he said it's impossible that he was on a cell phone back then. Impossible. Yeah, it's definitely impossible. I mean, the one thing, too, with, with Tupac, I, got, I still got a 45 bullet inch to my skull. And the thing about it is, they've been knowing all this type of stuff from day one. And they, that's why he violated me and sent me to prison last time. And the other thing is, for his, for Vegas, son, I'm quite sure they, 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 they saw the first one, they saw the second one, because it's the same circle of people, you know? I got tapped on the shoulder by, uh, by one of the cop's daughters that was involved, and she told me. I mean, you know, this isn't conjecture anymore. We know the facts. Yeah, it's the same people, same circle of people. Yeah. Have nothing to do with me, you know? No. If he's a friend of yours, he's a friend of mine. Exactly. You know, a lot of this stuff is just basically the public is naive to a lot of stuff. Yeah. And a lot of things in um, 
dealing with incarceration, even business, there's a lot of politics, you know. I mean, it's like, uh, I never should have went to prison the first time I went to prison. But I had caught the, the accounting firm, who Jimmy and this is to, they stole like about $30, 40000000 million, you know. My, my thing with my accounts was, I signed all my checks. So anything, any check was over over $5,000, I definitely had to sign it. And they was giving uh, David a hundred grand a month, and David said he was giving Jimmy a kickback for a hundred grand a month. So we was paying him for all the work he did as an attorney, and they was giving him a hundred grand a month. Wow. And buying cars and houses and stuff. So that, that, that played an effect on my, um, I'm making the violation when I shouldn't have got a violation. Well, that whole Orlando Anderson yeah. thing, man, I mean, it was really bullshit. Yeah, I mean, even when he came in, they put him on stand, and the judge asked me, said, do you know Sugar Knight? I said, you don't know Sugar Knight. I said, what did he do? So the only thing he did was help me and save my life, which I basically did, because, you know, Pac was uh, my little brother and the number one artist out on the bond, and if he would have got in trouble, he was going back to prison. Yeah. So I knew if cameras anywhere in Vegas because I went to UNLV and they take it to the top of them and let us watch. So, you know, I was breaking up saying, I did, you know, cut that bullshit out right in here. But at the same time, um, they just they just played with the thing the way they wanted to play with it. And um, see, the thing is, those guys, if you go back and watch the film, they was already stalking Pac. They yeah. watching him. So that just took the iceberg when something happened. But that was there was a plan already to do something to him. Yeah. And that's why, um, like I said, I had two of the toughest guys for him, and Reggie pulled them off of me. It didn't have to happen. I told him to send five guys from the club to there, and they never said nobody. Yeah. And Frank blocked us in purposely. Later he told us up to the streets. He told us they told him to do it. You know. Yeah. His cops, his cops, hey, Frank got so bad he died. You know. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. And Michael Moore. Yeah. My father had got some intelligence that some of the guys that was working for Shug or planning to um, hold him hostage and um, extort him for some money. I came around in 1995. Shug had wanted to try some, some cops that were doing security for him. I wasn't his choice, to be honest, uh, to probably be the head of security at the time. He really was reaching out. Uh, for my father, Reggie Sr. Okay. I um, started working with uh, Rightway Security in September of uh, 1995. And then... Uh... But there's still one last name that keeps coming up. Suge Knight's ex-wife, Sharitha. I have met Sharitha Knight. She was Suge's wife, mm -hmm. um, high school sweetheart. Suge made her an executive. She was like the manager of Snoop. She helped Suge manage Tupac. She was extremely business uh, and extremely professional. So she brought the professionalism to Death Row Records. The relationship between uh, Suge and uh, Sharitha was uh, sort of a love-hate relationship. She was not one that would allow herself to get mistreated. She was the only person that I ever knew of any of Suge's women that talked back to him. I found her to be, I don't know, mean. And I don't think she was that happy of a wife. She and Suge were living apart. Oh. She had her thing going, he had plenty of things going. What? And I think it was because of his activity that she decided to step right. out of her marriage as well. Sharitha would be the only person besides Suge who had a strong relationship with all of the artists at Death Row and she would be crucial to any attempt to take over Death Row Records. Did you sense a change in your husband as he became more successful? Yes, he, he changed a lot. Um, the Suge I knew became a stranger. Instead of Suge being the CEO behind the scenes of Death Row, Suge became the CEO in front of Death Row. It shouldn't have been like that. And I kept trying to tell Suge, why don't you stop? Suge needed to be the star. As an executive or co-owner of Death Row Records, did you start to say, I'm concerned about security 
of my artists and our investments. Yes, I I didn't, you know, they did a lot of stuff I didn't agree with. Let's go there. Uh, a lot of the fights and, and business tactic that they used, that's not me. It didn't happen at my office. You wanted things to be different, everybody migrated to my office because, okay, she don't do business like that. And they would always say, is this Suge stuff or is this yours? Which one is it? You know, we roll with you. Anything you want to do, we, we roll with you. And we had to, at a point, they wanted men and Suge to be separated. It's who done the business better. If it was an assassination attempt on Suge in Las Vegas, <laughs> who would have everything to gain? Sure. Well, I already had it. I was his wife. What do I need to kill you for? I could have took it in a divorce. What do I need to kill you for? These conspiracy theories are out there, and they're rampant. Uh, dirty cops uh, who were de facto running death row when she went to prison. Absolutely. Oh, God, all these theories. You know how many theories I hear in a day? OK, let's let's clear the theory. No, Shreetha and Reggie was not trying to kill Suge and Tupac. We had no reason to it. I could have took death row if I wanted death row. All the artists at death row was willing to come with me. So if I wanted to take death row from Suge, I could have taken death row a long time ago. That's not me. And the theory of the cops, uh, the cops that they trying to connect to death row were never hired on death row. We know who the chief suspect is, but yet nobody gets arrested. As a civil rights lawyer, I have to tell you, I go in courtrooms and they arrest black men with no evidence at all. What was different about this? Two black men was making too much money is off the street. You destroyed death row records with two people. Suge went to prison for a kick. A simple violation, and he was almost off of parole. A simple kick. Really? Well, who do you think killed Tupac? I believe Orlando Anderson killed Tupac. Are Sharitha and Reggie Wright Jr. telling the truth? Um, Perez and it was all involved. They were trying to kill me too, but see, because Perez and, and, and Reggie and was good friends, and Perez and Sharitha and Reggie is great friends, and so all those three together was trying to plot. Why they let me go? I don't know, but I'm out. Why they let me go? I don't know, but I'm out. We two individual people, we waged a coastal beef. Fire department, go ahead. We don't feel back the wheel. What's wrong? We're man shot in our car right now. You ain't supposed to be right now. Okay, they drove up next to us and just shot us the car in the passenger side. Okay, somebody's already on the way. Vic, you hear me, baby? And, and then I could see the motive was patently obvious. He'd done things that were hanging over him. He could have gone to prison for the rest of his life. He could make a deal to get out from under that. Uh, and But then he could also get revenge on every, anybody who had ever offended him in any way. Rocky Perez never mentioned Suge Knight in name. He just said they hit her and Reggie Wright uh, told him in name. Okay. Rocky Perez never mentioned Suge Knight in name. He just said they hit her and Reggie Wright. Okay. Rocky Perez never mentioned Suge Knight in name. He just said they hit her and Reggie Wright uh, told him and Mac they were trying to get the hit them. So it was just the million dollars for, for Puffy and Notorious B.I.G. I cheated on my employer. And I cheated on all of you, the people of Los Angeles. From what I was told, he gave almost 250 grand, you know, up front, and they owed him 750 grand on the back end. It's been said publicly that David Mack was actually the introduction of the concept that LAPD cops were working for death row records and were working for Suge Knight. And that's not true. Because long before David Mack ever robbed that bank, Ken Knox had logs that clearly spelled out who was working for death row records. And those logs were published to Los Angeles Police Department's Internal Affairs in June of 1996. In June of 1996, Capo status, respectfully checking in. Thank you for tapping into this throwback premiere. <laughs>
one of the reasons I feel this video was blocked because in June of 1996, when Pac filed in June of 1996, those paperwork against Kenner and Death Row. The next day, this cop started his investigation. They don't tell you that. June 26, Pac started the movement with the paperwork. The next day, capital status. Ken Knox had logs that clearly spelled out who was working for Death Row Records, and those logs were published to Los Angeles Police Department's Internal Affairs in June of 1996, even before the Shakur shooting took place. And they did a search warrant on his house for the bank robbery. Uh, he owned a black SS Impala, and that's the same vehicle that was used in the killing of Biggie Smalls. There's a number of clues uh, that connect uh, David Mack possibly to the killing. Red was just long for the ride at the time, going to uh, Death Row meeting with Reggie White. Uh, he was pretty much Mack's sidekick at, at this time. Uh, they went and got a mirror to get the job done. And Mack had already knew a mirror from, the next, from being from the uh, Nation of Islam, and he went to school together. He was already uh, in the staff for the Nation of Islam. That I was like, yo, thug life is dead. I was like, while I'm in jail, this is going to jail with me. Uh -huh. Nobody has the power. Nobody is like me to be able to represent this while I'm locked down. I thought I was going away for years. I couldn't let nobody represent that. And, all, and I was seeing how many soldiers I had by coming to jail. I was like, oh no, this shit is, I gotta stop it. I gotta rethink it, because I didn't plan thug life. I just said it, it was how I felt. I said it and I lived it. Now I gotta take my life, see what I live, what I represent, and I gotta dictate what this is, and then let niggas be a part of this. So that's why I killed it, and murdered it, and choked it. And all them niggas that was rapping with me, I murdered and choked their career as far as being with me. Because if it was a thug life, it would have been some, you know, shit would have happened different. Okay, so that's why I take these niggas' hearts. This nigga Biggie is three times bigger than me, and everybody sympathizing with him. They acting like I'm bullying him. This nigga three times bigger than me, and I'm asking this nigga to have a fight. I never trust the TV to get my point across, and I feel like. Yo, I feel like we need our confidence, self-esteem, and that's what I got in that. My confidence and my self-esteem. People might be like, this nigga conceited or whatever, but I, fuck it. I feel like I shine. And I don't give a fuck how much white people, the media, niggas, black people, play haters, police, whoever, try to darken my shine, I'm gonna always shine through. They can lie by my words, they always gonna ring true. Right, right. You know what I mean? Because it's my essence. It's in my essence. And that's what's gonna always come to. And I, I feel like that's true about me. Like now people be like, he's blasphemy. He's saying black Jesus as blasphemy. Or he's acting like he's elitist. He's like the Muslims. Or he's like a five percenter. It's nothing like that. It's only to get out. I feel like the, the our future is our confidence and self esteem. All this rape and gang banging and killing and thirty niggas fucking one girl. They all come from a low self esteem and no confidence. As soon as we get out, because I don't think like that. I don't think let me fuck thirty bitches. I don't even think like I want to be in a room when other niggas is fucking a bitch now. I don't think like that no more. And not because of jail, but because of my confidence is there, my self-esteem, my self-respect. You know, I don't need that. that. Uh -huh. But in the ghetto, that's the type of shit that we're taught. It's like in the army, you taught to kill, so you kill. You know what I mean? We uh -huh. taught that. My older niggas, we taught that. That the only thing we good for is our sexuality. Now I use that to make money. I enforce my strength, my mind strength. That's what's more important to me now. The niggas see that this is not no accident. I plotted every single step from this to this. Right. You know what I mean? Everything is plotted. This hell that you, that the next shit is called Illuminati, because that's, that's really what the Illuminati don't. That's why I put the K to it. Cause right. I wanted, the niggas is telling me about this Illuminati shit while I'm in jail, right? Like, the dollars, dollars. Right, 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 right. That's another way to keep your self esteem low. That's, that's that another shit. way yeah. to keep you unconfident. Me and Biggie's situation is smaller than that. Me and Biggie's situation is like some mob shit. Like, yeah. they're the boss. Right, when right, I was right. in jail, bad boy, Puffy was the crown fucking badon. Even though Suge, as big as he was, and Snoop, right, right. at that point, they, they just with too many sales, it, they, they took the whole shit. Yeah. Because Suge had Snoop to worry about with the trial. He couldn't right, be right. out there. That's what you're supposed to do. Right, 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 right. Into Tupac, a young cat. I want to join the family, dog. Get me out. I want to join the band. Don't for putting me in jail. They just put niggas in jail when they want to. You, you got shot last year. Talk about this. This whole year has been a pretty heavy, yeah. traumatic year since about no the doubt. end of '93 or something like that. No beginning of '94. Talk about that. Talk about a little bit. Of getting shot. I got shot five times.
by some dudes who wanted my jewelry. That's what they said they wanted my jewelry, but I think they're trying to rub me out, really. Mm -hmm. Why did they think so? Because, man, if they wanted my jewelry, they, they could have took my jewelry. They didn't take everything. Don't nobody, don't robbers don't leave behind uh, $80,000 Rolexes. You know what I mean? They don't do that, in case nobody know. Um, and robbers usually will rob you and break, break out. Mm -hmm. You know, robbers don't stop too many times to fill you with five bullets and don't nobody, there's four people there and you're the only nigga to catch five bullets. Robbers don't do it like that. Those are murderers who do things like that. But it's all good. I'm, you know, God, great, let me come back. Right from the get-go, detectives believed somehow Death Row Records was involved. Phil Carson was committed to this case. I mean, he had made a case. I mean, he was ready to make arrests. He was convinced that Mack and Muhammad and other LAPD officers had been involved in setting up Biggie's murder. He, I mean, he was all the way in on it. He was ready to file, but his superiors, you know, basically blocked him and eventually took him off it. Just like Kenneth Knox, you know, the, he, he was right there, ready to make a case. He was told no. So Carson, basically just like Knox, to save his career, uh, backed off. Jackie, we were uh, both on duty that day uh, on a set. And it was in the evening time because it was already night. And where I got this phone call from Yasmin Fula. And she said, hey, Frank, I'm coming down to a gridlock. Uh, don't you and Kevin leave because I need to talk to the two of you. So, you know, probably 30 minutes later, uh, she shows up. And um, she goes, hey. She goes, uh, there's some things going on over at the uh, death row office. Uh, Pac is called an audit on the death row office. Now, this was the first time I had ever heard anything about an audit, obviously, because she came down to tell us this uh, uh, story about, you know, the audit going on. And her, her main thing was that um, she wanted us to pay, like, a little bit more closer attention uh, to Pac, watch him a little bit closer because uh, she wasn't sure of the repercussions of this audit that was going to be going on because apparently hot Pac was pretty hot over it. The first time it was made aware to me that there was a problem with Tupac and Death Row was on the set of Gridlock. Yasmin, who was Yak Fula's mom, was Tupac's uh, assistant. And she had called, uh, called me that evening and said, I'm gonna come down to the set. I need to talk to you and Kevin Hackey about some things that's going on with Pac in death row. She didn't go into any great details about anything. And she told us basically to step up our game and watch him. I got a call from Al Giddens. I was at home, I lived in Orange County. And Al Giddens says to me, hey, um, you need to get to the studio because Pac is trying to, you know, take masters out of the uh, studio. And Suge has told us that no one is to take masters from the studio anymore. He called me specifically knowing that I was Pac's bodyguard saying, hey, you need to get down here. You need to talk to him. Uh, you need to calm him down. He's cussing. He's going off. He's going crazy. Three of the phone calls came from Mr. Wright and one phone call came from Al Giddens, who was also head of 662 security and I asked him I go Al why are you calling my room at 8 10 after you know 10 after 8 if I'm not supposed to be there at 10 and his answer was Reggie just called me and told me to call you I said well don't call me no more and then after that all my phone calls came directly from Mr. Wright Doug and all the artists from Death Row Reggie met with us out front in his own meeting and instructed us to say certain things and when I got into the meeting, it was a meeting based, the meeting was basically about what happened. And the artists were drilling security about what methods we had used and what were some of our tactics. At that time, Suge wasn't even aware that I was still doing security. Um, Reggie had taken me to a, um, another job that he was doing at a church, uh, securing a uh, church up in uh, Inglewood from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. I looked around and no one said it. No one was speaking up for security. So I seen it was more, and I've been in these type of meetings before, uh, even at the fire station. It's almost like a, similar to a political type meeting of, of, of far the higher, you know, of what was going on. So I was one of the few people that spoke up and said, wait a minute, we were instructed not to carry weapons. And none of the artists knew that.
They didn't know we were instructed not to carry weapons that day. And it looked like Reggie wasn't going to say that information to them. So I spoke up and said, no, we were instructed not to carry weapons that day. And that's why no one in security, with probably at the exception of me, had a weapon. So Suge wasn't even aware that I was still working with Right Way. I remember uh, Michael um, <clears throat> asking me, or telling me rather, I'm sorry, telling me that um, Reggie had told Suge that I was no longer working with uh, Right Way Security. And I would have uh, wondered what he would have uh, done or how he would have felt to have known that I was still working for Right Way all the way up until uh, the end of November. Well in that car. Mm -hmm. Are you doing okay today? I can see you're injured. I got a bullet still in my head. The bullet's still in your head? Yes. The first thing he said, laughingly, jokingly, loudly, is, I need a hospital? You the one shot in the head. Don't you think you need a hospital? You mean you guys were laughing? We had conversations and jokes when all, after all this took place. And I think that that kept him there, and it definitely kept me there. And guess what? Jimmy Iovine sent me to prison and stole it from me. Have you ever seen a motherfucking CEO from a record company all of a sudden be joined to the hip with Andre? They dressing light, they doing headphones together, they doing headphones together, all for what? Universal money? Suge and Dre played as the chronic. And the song G thing reminded me of when I first heard Satisfaction. It just did. You gotta remember one thing, Interscope was a couple of weeks ago in bankrupt before they met me. Interscope wanted my artists. I said, hey, I gotta own the masters, we gotta own the masters. They said, how you know about that? I said, I know the business. We're not gonna be the one doing all the work and y'all get all the money and own it. It's not gonna happen. Modern day slavery, no different. I always felt that David Kenner was, um, for David Kenner. It has been my personal pleasure to work on a daily basis with a ship night. David Kenner was the shadow who was always at death row. One of the things that puzzles me is how Kenner was able to help Snoop beat that murder rap. Yet, Suge Knight ends up with a nine-year prison, prison sentence over a parole violation. A lot of things that no one else knows about. The Vegas Police Department knew exactly what was going on. It stunk to high heaven and they didn't want any part of it. On the way out, Orlando Anderson says to Brent Becker, are you going to arrest me? Brent Becker says, arrest you for what? Do I, do I think we know who did it? Yeah. And the further and harder that Compton pushed the matter, the further the Vegas police backed away and the further that they didn't want anything to do with it. Right off the bat, we're wanting to talk to the guy that's in the car with Tupac Shakur, Suge Knight. And we're working right away with that. And in fact, the night of the shooting, we tried to talk to him, but were refused access to him by uh, members of death row, uh, attorneys. And uh, in fact, it took three days to get to talk to Suge Knight. And here's where David Kenner comes into play. David Kenner was a former prosecutor that suddenly, for whatever reason, decided he wanted to start defending criminals, and he became a defense attorney. He was a very good defense attorney. And we kept getting the run around, yeah, yeah, we'll get you in touch with him. Yes, we'll do this, yes, we'll do that. Who was giving you the runaround? Uh, David Kenner's office. He, it was actually an umbrella that covered a lot of the legal shenanigans that were going on at Death Row Records. Tupac, that was Tupac. No, he got shot. No, he got shot. Who besides yourself down there knows, uh, for a while, knows about these guys killing Tupac? Pretty sure everybody around there knows about it. In a tape confession never before shown on film. Which of those four is it when you talk to him about murdering Tupac? I mean, I'll we'll wipe their out quick. You know, it's nothing. We, we, we want a you have to understand that Greg Kading admitted in 2011 and several years after he was off the police department that he personally had not seen any of the evidence that had been presented to Discovery. Try to point to somebody else to say, this is the reason why. And, and I'm just, you've heard the rumors, so oh, I'm getting, oh, I want you to vindicate yourself while the world is watching. I think that's crazy to even think or believe it myself. And I'll stop there. Right. When Suge when came, 
to the to, to the to the club. We asked what was going on. Everybody was finna leave. They was finna shut six six two down. Shug said no. He gonna be all right. He was hit in his medallion. So everybody kept partying. We all stayed there and we partied all night. And uh, I think the next morning or some day after, they said Tupac was dead. So it was like, wow, y'all said he finna live, but then now, he, now he's gone. I was like, you all right, homie? He was like, all right, homie, I love you. I like, shit, love you too, fool. You better get better, you know. That's. That's the relationship we had. They want to put me in jail for something I did a long time ago, and I can't really blame them because I was a, a, you know, kind of a bad person before. But now I'm trying to do something with my life, and they won't let me. I can't do nothing in jail. They keep trying to shove me in jail. They talking about how overcrowded it is, but yet they still trying to shove me in there. That's all right. Got anything to say? The latest is he still re he remains in critical condition, which was his condition when he arrived here at UMC. I've been told uh, this evening that he is scheduled for some additional surgery, which is not unusual when you have uh, injuries that are this severe. So we're planning on taking him to back to surgery sometime this evening. Is there a problem we hear with his lung? Is that something yeah. that is going to look at? Well, he has, he has numerous injuries. He has multiple gunshot wounds to the chest. And so, yes, that's always a possibility that a lung could be hit, a lung could collapse, or there could be other internal injuries that might need additional attention in the OR. And um, he, was, he, was trying to, he was trying to tell me something. He was shaking the bed. He was, you know, all the bullets in him. He was still shaking the bed. And he wanted to tell me something, but he, he couldn't. And I was just trying to tell him to chill, just get better. We go, you know what I'm saying? No, he is not. Sorry. He, he is he is not sitting up, and he is not talking. Probably he was sedated. Yes, he is. He is unconscious. On the night of September seventh, nineteen ninety six. Tupac Shakur joins Suge Knight and other members of the Death Row Entourage in Las Vegas to watch the heavyweight championship fight between Mike Tyson and Bruce Seldon at the MGM Grand Hotel. It was after the Tyson fight and uh, Suge Knight and Tupac and several of Suge Knight's entourage were walking through the lobby. One of the guys in their entourage, his name is Trevon Lane. Trayvon Lane, a blood member, spotted a person that he recognized from several months earlier as one of the persons that had assaulted him at the Lakewood Mall in California. And immediately mentioned Tupac, hey, that guy's from the Crips. He's one of the guys that jumped me from my medallion. September 7th, 1996, 11 p.m. A black BMW cruises slowly down the Las Vegas Strip. Inside, rap and film star Tupac Shakur sits in the passenger seat. Death Row Records kingpin Marion Suge Knight is behind the wheel. No one sees the white Cadillac that slowly pulls up alongside or the gun that's aimed directly at Tupac. Tupac is hit several times in the chest. He's rushed to the University Medical Center, but surgeons can't stop the internal bleeding. Vowing revenge, quickly organized a meeting with his fellow Crips at the Treasure Island Hotel. There they devised a plan to take their revenge. At 10.30 p.m., Tupac and Suge, leading a procession of fancy cars, drove north on Las Vegas Boulevard. They then turned right onto Flamingo Road toward Suge's night spot, Club 662. At 11 p.m., Anderson and three other Crips set off in search of Tupac. Heading out of the Treasure Island Valet parking circle in their white Cadillac, they linked up with another car and drove south on Las Vegas Boulevard. When they turned onto Flamingo Road, fate intervened. Just ahead, Suge Knight's black BMW. A panicked Suge drove his bullet-ridden sedan across the median and crashed into a curb. Las Vegas police rushed to the scene and called an ambulance for the gravely wounded Tupac. He would die six days later, his family by his side. I walked in the room to visit him, and he was shaking the whole bed. He was a warrior, you know, to the end. According to Phillips, the Crips escaped undetected, speeding back on I-15 to Los Angeles in the dead of night. 
In the days following the shooting, the Vegas police made little headway in their investigation. We've looked at it several times. Uh, we have no indication or, or actually nothing that it's going to lead us in a direction to arrest anyone that was involved. On October 2nd, Compton, California police detained Anderson as part of a gang roundup to curb violence in the wake of the murder. And although Las Vegas police questioned Anderson, they apparently didn't think much of his possible connection to the murder. They'd be arresting those dudes for murder. You know he's somewhere smoking hey, a Cuban cigarette. Hey, man, um, I don't got no, no problems with nobody. I wish peace and happiness. And, uh... What do you people, what's, what's the thing that people don't understand about you the most? What do you think the press has done? wrong. They have made me um, immortal. In what way? Were you? In a bad way and in a good way. In a bad way because they've made me just something that I'm not. You know what I mean? Because what they do is uh, take advantage of one side of me and just make that me. Mm -hmm. um, they don't put the good with the bad. If you put the good with the bad, I'm, I really seem normal. I mean, maybe a little, a, a little bit better than normal, but I st I'm still normal if you put the good with the bad. If you just look at the bad, you're going to be like, damn, that nigga crazy. That nigga's retarded. You know what I mean? But if you, if you just took all my good, you'd be like, oh, he's he, he mad soft, he don't do shit, you know, he corny. But if you put it together, I'm talking about the good stuff. That, what do they overlook? The good stuff? I'll take care of a lot of people, man. I don't have any kids. I'm, you know, I don't have nothing, no responsibilities, and I'll take care of a lot of people. And so, um, and I do that not to say I could do, I just do it out of the kindness of my heart because I feel like if you do something good, it'll come back to you. So I take care of a lot of people. I take care of my whole family. I give away cars and all that type of shit. Buy sneakers for people, take care of people. Can I get one of those? Um, I think I do good, like, in those ways. I think my music is good music. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think the shit that I say, no one else says. To talk about that, you, you Nobody, do like completely different no, songs and you kind of like little who, short stories. Like who that. was writing about black women before Keep Your Head Up? Now everybody got a song about black women. Mm -hmm. But who was writing about that when who I was wrote writing about, about that? Their papa. I who was writing papa about their own, they own problems? I wasn't talking about just, you know, blah, 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 blah. I was talking about my real problems. I was really having problems with police. I was really having problems with, you know, life and just being black. And why, why the hell we got to get stepped on so much, you know? But damn, I'm making it. I thought I was successful. Well, I'm still getting stepped on. How come I still got a boot print on my back? And I'm successful. I just couldn't believe that. So instead of me just bugging out and doing a post office move and just shooting everything out and going to jail for a million years, I just said, fuck it, you know what? I'm in here rapping. Why not just rap about some shit that's really happening? You know what I mean? And that's what I did. And that's when they started really kicking my ass for real. IRS and, oh man, every cop everywhere, any kind of candidate want to come. I mean. The Las Vegas Academy of International Studies performing visual arts, thank you. Buy off the police and prosecution of Las Vegas to cover up illegal wrongdoing on the night of the murder? If you ask Vegas strip club owner Michael Gallardi as part of his FBI informant testimony, it was. In one interview with the FBI, Gallardi said that he maintained cash reserves or club banks of $75,000 at Cheetahs and $125,000 at Jaguars. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Typically, the policemen would each have access to $500 per visit. The practice of catering to policemen started from the time Gallardi said he opened in 1990 to buy drinks and lap dances for those individuals. All told, Gallardi implicated at least 11 police officers, all of whose identities were removed from the documents obtained by the Las Vegas Sun. Thank you, County Commission Vice Chair Paul Christensen. For his part, Sheriff Bill Young told the Las Vegas Sun that the activities of the officers did not rise to the level of crimes. Apparently, bribery and corruption isn't a crime in Las Vegas anymore. And what of Gallardi? Was his word any better than those he accused? As a star witness for the FBI, it apparently was. We just signed a contract the United States government did with IBM to build jointly a supercomputer over the next couple of years. They will do as many calculations in one second as you can do at home on your calculator in 30,000 years. And then, uh, best rapper alive. Tupac. <laughs> He's not alive. You say he lives on. Not alive. I know. I keep doing that. <laughs> you 
Okay. Listen, West Coast girls think Tupac lives on. I'm with you. I'm with you. So Tupac, keep going. Thank you. It was getting to the point where I was having cases everywhere I went. People would just bump into me and be like, Tupac hit me. And it was getting retarded. And then they got the vice president on TV saying, your shit ain't no good. So, of course, it makes people think, oh, my God, he's a true menace. And then the newspapers went, oh, Tupac spit at the cameras. I'm spitting at the cameras because I bet you everybody, I'm not going to do that no more. Let me just say that. I changed. But I bet you everybody who um, ever been in that position where you're, in your private life, you're getting in your own car, you're not at no premiere nowhere, get in your car, and there's 50 cameras there, shoving their way into your car. You want to hit, but instead of hitting, you just, can I get my own personal space? I, mean, I wasn't just running after camera yeah. dudes. I saw my own, per I can't, there's a camera right here. You know what I mean? And I didn't ask for it to be there, and that's my own personal space. How come females can be violated, but niggas can't get violated? That was violation. Motherfucker put a camera right here that I did not ask for, is violation, so... But I got mad at that, you know, things like that. People didn't understand, well, why was he doing that? I wasn't doing that for the shock effect. I was doing that because, God damn, you know, they wasn't respecting me. So they didn't deserve to be respected at that time. Now I'm wise and I know, just let them disrespect me because it's better in the long run because I was just disrespected like a motherfucker in the jail. So, and I learned that that's the price you pay when you don't swallow a lot of shit. I just was a bad shit swallower last year. But now I see... How's it feel to be free now? Free feels so good. You know, like a week ago, I was locked down for 23 hours. Somebody coming by telling me to clean up my cell, getting tickets for that, and, you know, in a small, tiny closet, and no hot water, and you got to eat this nasty food. And I was like, you know, all I kept in my mind was one day, I'll be back. And I plot and plan, and got so many plans. And my first plan was to do an album in two days, if I could, in two days. Well, now... It's taking us a week, so we are alright, we still there. After this, I wrote a movie while I was locked down, and uh, I'm going to put that out. Um, I'm going to be in it. movie about? It's called Live to Tell. <laughs> it's about... Um, you wrote the whole script on you? I wrote the whole script, it's all finished. Mm -hmm. It's about um, this guy who's just coming of age. It starts out from when he's a child all the way to when he's, uh, you know, in his 40s or whatever, 30s. And, and he's finally understanding, like, what is life really about? It's not like Minister of Society or Boys to Good or nothing like that, but um, it's about life. I think it's really about life. I, it's semi autobiography. I put some of the shit about my life in there just to like um, keep it real. But And I put stuff that I heard when I was in there. The rap star Tupac Shakur seems to play police stations more than arenas these days, and while he was making his latest courtroom appearance, his accuser was saying she feels more like she's somebody's new target. Amy Atkins reports. At his arraignment, Tupac Shakur had two words to say about charges that he sexually abused a 20-year-old woman. Not guilty. Afterward, he had a few more choice words, launching into a series of expletives about journalists. Find out what really happened and report the story. If not, you ain't shit. You just like the rest of these bitches trying to bring me down. So that's why I curse you motherfuckers out if you say it back here. Then he told Fox News producer Michelle Williams just why he's so mad. And the way the world is today, a woman can say anything about a man and I'm guilty until proven, you know what I'm saying? It's like I don't even have a chance. Everybody already made me guilty. My career's already going this way. Did she lie? Of course she lied. The truth is that she was sodomized in a hotel suite by Tupac and his associates. According to the criminal complaint, on November 18th at the Parker Meridian Hotel, the rap star and three friends took turns forcing the woman to engage in oral sex. Prosecutors told Judge George Roberts that the woman accusing Shakur has been receiving drop the case or else threats. It's a fact. She's been receiving threats, physical threats against her life, threats um, to coerce her to drop the charges. She's under police protection. Judge Roberts didn't buy it. Otherwise, he would have increased the bail or imposed some other type of sanction. Tupac Shakur will be back in court here in New York next week to set a trial date in this case. On January 12th, he's expected to be in an Atlanta courtroom for allegedly slapping a fan. On January 25th, there's a hearing in Texas involving a state trooper who was shot by a man listening to Tupac Shakur's lyrics. And Tupac himself has been accused of shooting two police officers in Atlanta. He's keeping every police department in the country busy. He's a one-man crime wave. Amy Atkins, Fox News. He pleaded innocent Wednesday in Atlanta to aggravated assault charges.
He was arrested last month for allegedly shooting and wounding two off-duty police officers after an argument. One of the officers is also charged in the case. In an unrelated case, Shakur is denying allegations he had sex with a minor. New York police seized a videotape allegedly showing him in a hotel room with a woman who appears to be underage. The tape was confiscated as part of an investigation into sex abuse charges against uh, the rapper. You know, because I was in there with dudes that was never going to see the sunlight no more. Dudes that knocked out their own lawyer. I'm listening to this dude tell me he knocked out his own lawyer. He did not like, the, you know, the way it was going down, and he knocked his own lawyer. I said, well, you didn't think he was going to get out after that, did you? He was like, no, nah, man, well, that's, that's the thing. That's the homeboy was like, that's what I had to do. Um, and it made me like appreciate life more. I mean, you know, so what? I got shot. I'm cool though. I don't have any scars. You know what I mean? Um, I don't slur my words. My hands both go up. Everything is still cool. Um, was it a tough recovery? Nope. Sure wasn't. Mm -hmm. I was walking around. They put me in jail three weeks after I got shot. Five times. No stories on 2020 about the miraculous. You know, survival or nothing. You know what I mean? I was like, damn, I'm just, they treat us like super idiots. God damn, you know what I mean? If Marky Mark would have took five bullets, it would have been on the news for about at least a year. <laughs> like, that nigga is Superman. He's Marky Mark. He's the man. A nigga take five bullets, it's just like, when you going to be ready to go to jail? <laughs> it's just ready. Y'all was bred to take five bullets. You're supposed to be a, you know? That messed me up, and all the jokes, like uh, Jay Leno and all the dudes making jokes and shit. They don't make jokes about white people when they get shot. Nobody wasn't joking about uh, Reagan when he got shot. One shit funny. I know. It was so, what's so cheap about my life, you know, that these niggas could just tell jokes. Then they wonder why we act the way we act. Why we, we act so anti-everything. It's because they are so anti-us. You know what I mean? I'm I'm sitting in, in jail in the hospital looking at TV and this fool making jokes. Who was the guy? Who was like the guy? Sort of guy that, Rush so, Limbaugh? Yeah, Rush Limbaugh. Did he say something yeah. the day you got shot? Yeah. yeah. He was so, glad or something like yeah. that. Yeah. So, um, I wrote his ass a letter though when I was in jail. It is? Yeah, I sure did. So when you were in jail, did anybody come visit you? Who came visit you? Um, a lot of people, Jada. Um, a lot of people don't make me answer that because they're not going to remember everybody. Al Sharpton helped me out a lot. Uh -huh. Got me moved into a good unit and all mm -hmm. of that. They had me locked down all day, every day at first. Mm -hmm. So Al Sharpton like, kind of intervened for me. Um, Tony Danza wrote me, though. That was like one of the best letters I got the whole mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Just that he was a fan. He liked the album, Keep My Head Up. And mm -hmm. when I come out, come out stronger. And that, that was like one of the best letters I got the whole Did time. Did you know him before that? You just wrote no, it? Never met him. Anything else like that? That's cool. Um... Mothers writing me, mm -hmm. thanking me, um, telling me to talk to their kids, kids writing me, girls writing me, telling me, you know, I, I helped. I got at least a thousand letters with females saying, you helped me get through this or you helped me get through that, we keep your head up. Mm -hmm. So that made me be like, that's cool, you know, I'm, I'm finna, you know. Girls was writing me saying, I don't want you to answer my letters back. I don't want nothing. I'm just keep writing you because I feel like I got to get this off my chest. You help me, now I'm going to help you. At a news conference, his attorney said authorities are out to get Shakur. It is quite clear to us that the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and the New York City Police Department are reacting in desperation after recognizing that their case is inherently suspect. Shakur is charged with assaulting a 20-year-old woman. The incident allegedly occurred in the hotel room where police found the tape. Los Angeles Police Chief William Bratton had just become New York City's police commissioner. He dismisses the notion of a conspiracy. So this was alleging is a conspiracy against Tupac uh, to prevent his rise to fame. It uh, certainly failed, so uh, I, I wouldn't pay too much credence to those allegations. Once again, it's a way of trying to deflect attention from the issue, which should be violence. Tupac's trial began in late 1994. His image as a thug was central to the prosecution, but his defenders say he was on trial more for his status as a rap icon than as an alleged rapist. The government was able to make an argument in the course of the case of this jury about Tupac and thug life. The prosecution declined to speak with hip-hop justice, but Professor Charles Ogletree remains convinced that the deck was stacked against Tupac. You may not like his personality, you may not like his lyrics, you may not like his tattoos, you may not like his wealth, 
But none of those, not a single one, in any way makes him guilty. Tupac grabbed his own gun. Shots were fired. Both white men were hit. They were cops. But the off-duty officers were found to have been drinking. One of the guns they carry turned out to have been stolen from a police evidence locker. All charges against Tupac were dropped. Tupac had shot two police officers in Georgia and walked away a legend. Some now believe that after Atlanta, Tupac was marked for a takedown by police. But as the jury deliberated, the prosecution's portrayal of Tupac as a gangster seemed to play out in shocking fashion. Making his way into this Manhattan recording studio after court, Tupac was shot five times and seriously wounded by an unknown gunman. Two days later, Tupac was wheeled into court to face the verdict. Guilty on two counts of sexual abuse. He was sentenced to one and a half to four and a half years in prison. Did the fate of rapper Tupac Shakur. Guilty on three counts of sexual abuse, he now faces one and a half to four and a half years in prison. The main impetus for the incarceration of Mr. Shakur was from City Hall. Mr. Giuliani himself 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 was from City Hall. Mr. Giuliani himself. Being 23, being black, and last name being Shakur in America, he never had a chance. Because I didn't want to rap no more. I was finished. I was like, fuck it. You know, I already went platinum. I already did everything I wanted to do, so I didn't want to do it no more. I already went number one. I already did my little thing. Nobody ain't say nothing about how I was in the, the maximum state penitentiary with the number one album in the whole wide fucking country. They just said, fuck it. First white group get a number one record, I mean, on, on white country record. Just white country R&B, anything. They go, oh my God, that's fucking wonderful. <laughs> These guys are so talented. They got it all, everything. They got the look. I'm in jail. No promo, not man, nothing. My shit going number one all across the boards. Man, no, all they want to talk about is Tupac is in jail. He's not getting out. This is what he's in jail for. That's character assassination, if you ask me. Because if I was that hell of a bad person, my music wouldn't sound like that. It wouldn't affect people. When you go, you know, number one, that's not just black people. That ain't just thugs. You know what I mean? Number one in the whole country mean number one in the whole country. You know what I mean? So 400,000 copies on the first week, wasn't it? Yeah, no question. I broke yeah, records. I broke, I broke records. Nobody ever did what I just did. Um, I was beating dudes who my mama used to listen to. Bruce Springsteen and all of that. I was like, damn. You know, do you know what Mama this means? Bruce yeah, hell yeah. I'm on this country. I, <laughs> dudes is banging on the wall in the whole jail. Everybody following where I'm, what I'm doing with my album. You just beat this dude. You just beat this dude. You doing that. Um, so that made me feel good. You know, that was like some kind of a, that was the only revenge I really wanted. To be self-productive. I organized the OGs in the East Coast and the West Coast and the penitentiaries to come up with codes of ethics for criminals. It's called the code of thug life. It's a code putting order to the violence on the street. In Watts, Compton, Chicago, wherever. We got all these people all over the country saying, yes, we go by this code. We're going to be against attacks on people that are not involved with the street gang, with the drug trade, or the illegal business at all. You know, all that kidnapping and shooting drive-bys out the car. We're against that. Autopsy photo of Tupac, and why was it released to her, and what is your opinion of her putting that out in her book? Did that hurt the investigation? Exactly, yeah. The photo that was released, I don't know how she got it. I probably have suspicions. It wasn't released legitimately. It shouldn't have been out there. And I can tell you that it was not a police photo in that it was not a photograph we had taken during the autopsy because the photo that was released was a post-procedure photo we don't take post-procedure photos. The only photos we take are of evidentiary value as in wounds or things like that where the medical examiner, the, the forensic pathologist says this is something that's relevant. We just don't take pictures of dead bodies just to do it. And we sure don't take pictures of dead bodies after they've been autopsied and sewn back up so to speak 
preparation to be transported to the mortuary for, for whatever the next of kin want done with the remains. I'm surprised, but I'm happy. I believe that, you know, this is all in God's hands. And I'm very appreciative to God for everything I've gotten to do. I see on earth. He's, I mean, at the worst, he's just somewhere quiet. Rumors. In the years since rapper Tupac Shakur's death, you've heard them all. Or have you? But why do people believe Tupac is still alive? Perhaps the biggest reason, his last CD, entitled Machiavelli. In ancient times, Machiavelli was an Italian philosopher who suggested the best way to escape your enemies, fake your own death. Could Tupac have done this? The San Francisco radio station says more than 500 of its listeners said they saw Tupac in Cuba. Or was it really Cuba? If you're into numbers, Tupac's death should be an even bigger mystery. Take a look at some information from a Detroit News article. It indicates Tupac was shot seven months after his All Eyes on Me CD hit the record stores. He was shot September 7. Add the digits of his age when he was shot, and they add to seven. Even the precise time of his death, 403, adds to the number seven. And the subtitle of his Machiavelli album is The Seven Day Theory. He's, I mean, at the worst, he's just somewhere quiet.